and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason where you shall find us each week. I'm Doug Keck here at the Mothership in Irondale, Alabama in the 40th year of Mother Angelica starting everything all off for EWTN and we thank her for that, doing that and we thank you for watching and we thank you for emailing your questions to Spitzer's Universe at EW10.com because it really is a big part of the program. Don't forget to check out Father Spitzer's Magis Center website and CredibleCatholic.com. Who knows, maybe he's got another one out there. We'll find out later. He's always adding new things. And, of course, a reminder, the show is always available on EWTN On Demand and our YouTube channel. So if you miss any portion of the program, you can check it out whenever you get a chance to or want to show a specific answer or discussion to somebody you think needs to hear it or see it. It's a perfect opportunity. We're talking about Jesus' defeat of Satan and the temptations in the desert uh, from Father's book, of course, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Naturally, where all great Catholic things are, EWTNRC.com. Two great books out from EWTN Publishing, Mother Angelica's Living the Scriptures. you got to check that out from her great television series. And also, The House Was Filled with the Fragrance of the Perfume by Cardinal Fernando Fellani. Very interesting book. Check that out as well. And speaking of interesting people we get to talk to on a regular basis, we turn now to Father Spitzer and welcome him once again and ask him to uh, pray us into the program. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this program and the ministry in it, and we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that whatever we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Please give continued healing to Pope Francis, and please, uh, uh, dear Lord, uh, continue to watch over our country and our families through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good to see you, Father. Hope you've had a, a good week. I'm assuming things are reasonably normal, even in California these days. Is that true? <laughs> well, that's a stretch. But anyway, uh, and, uh, normalcy in California don't generally uh, uh, go in the, the hand in hand. But let's just say uh, pretty normal. <laughs> okay. Speaking of California, there was a recent article in... Uh, uh, Life News reported that the University of California, San Francisco, which they described as a hub for all things abortion in the United States, is reportedly harvesting aborted babies' genitalia and other organs for research, according to the documents obtained by certain pro-life uh, advocates. Uh, they talk about the fact that this university runs more than 100 abortion training programs across the country, including training on how to abort viable late-term unborn babies after 21 weeks of pregnancy, uh, according to the, the organization reporting this. With this in mind, Pro-Life San Francisco asked the University for documents pertaining to its practices and protocols for babies and who survive abortions. Received no response. Then the response they finally got from the lawyers was that such documents do not exist because the Women's Option Center have no protocol for determining the viability of abortion survivors or providing care for them, which gives you an idea of uh, what's going on there. I thought that uh, it's always good to remind people, albeit on a regular basis, of the horrors that are going on here that we're probably yep. all no, going to have to answer uh, for, so, you know. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, they surely have shielded themselves with effective rationalizations, but, yeah, that's pretty bad. I mean, all of it is uh, terrible. Another uh, story popped up, and uh, this isn't to necessarily point at any particular diocese, but I thought it was interesting that a story came out in the uh, Catholic News Agency, uh, which EWTN uh, operates, uh, CNA, along with the Register. Mm -hmm. uh, the Diocese of Burlington has reported a record low number of priests this year, only 50 diocesan priests ministering to the entire state of Vermont, and of only 36 of them are listed in active ministry. They've got one newly ordained priest and one seminarian. So, I mean, it's interesting, too, because wow. I mean, there's only a little over 100,000 Catholics in Vermont, but it strikes yeah. me that when you're, you know, it seems to be a little bit of an impact of also having what's probably considered one of the most liberal states in the United States. I wonder if there's a, there's a correlation, but is there a causality? I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a correlation, but the causality, as you say, it's really very, very difficult to determine. Mm -hmm. The point, of course, is that um, that uh, <laughs> they're going to probably have to do something radical mm -hmm. uh, fairly soon, either bring in priests from other states um, uh, or they're going to have to really put a, um, you know, a real emphasis on promoting vocations, praying for, for vocations, mm -hmm. because if they do not, uh, I just don't see how the, the church is going to survive um, in that area. But um, anyway, these are uh, things that I don't fully understand, but uh, right. I, I know that there's a very low uh, number of Catholics um, in, the, in the state of Vermont, but still right. 50 priests, 36 of which are active ministry. Right. Uh, that, that's a recipe for uh, real, real difficulty and challenges for the poor Catholic parishioners going forward into the right. future. And I think part of it is with the COVID, some of the uh, priests from overseas uh, had to leave, et cetera, due to their, their status and green card status and things like that, which I think was mm -hmm. impacted to some degree by the restrictions that have been put on related to COVID. So that kind of compounds mm -hmm. that problem. Probably not yeah. just for that particular diocese or state either. It's probably oh, yeah. just no, emblematic of a problem mm -hmm. that's out there across the board. This was an interesting story, I thought. Somebody wrote us a letter. It was a, a, a and I just thought I'd mention it. Uh, a woman wrote to us uh, and, and talked about the fact that her and her husband worked in the 80s f in uh, Saudi Arabia for Aramco, and mm -hmm. she was talking about uh -huh. her experience dealing with Muslims, and she, she had this really uh, positive experience with this one gentleman who was her boss uh, when she mm -hmm. was being given a hard time about taking time to pray, and, and her boss said, uh, God is number one. There's always time for God. Uh, and she yeah. says how that statement changed her life. And she thought it was funny mm -hmm. that she learned this lesson from an Arab Muslim, that there is always time for God. Uh, and I just thought that mm -hmm. that was a great thing to remember when we are thinking about the commonality of religious people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, uh, anybody who makes that statement is going to be heralded by any Catholic. Uh, that's for sure. Um, because uh, God is number one, and I think that that's one of the principal ways we can be an evangelist without saying or, or doing much more, uh, just helping people to not only understand that God's number one, but giving them the freedom to allow God to be number one in their lives. I think it's a great thing. It certainly is a basis for a unity of religion. Right. Absolutely. Very good. Let's get to some questions uh, because we've got quite a few I haven't gotten around to. Dear Father Spitzer, uh -huh. on a recent show you seem to imply that in vitro fertilization might be acceptable if it could be done with a single embryo. I thought IVF was also unacceptable because the church teaches that children can only be created through the conjugal act. Is this correct, Zach? That, uh, well, you are absolutely correct, Zach, and I <laughs> certainly didn't mean to imply that. Um, you're absolutely correct. There's two principal reasons why in vitro fertilization is disallowed. The first one, of course, is a, a very serious one. That is, children uh, are being <laughs> killed in order to um, uh, uh, promote uh, uh, the, uh, the life of, of one child. Uh, you're killing multiple other ones. And that is, you know, the, the forefront uh, reason, which I was uh, probably stressing too much. But that is correct. Uh, you, the church teaches that the proper way to have children is through the conjugal act. Right. Absolutely. In that same vein, dear Father Spitzer, two of my granddaughters are using in vitro fertilization to conceive. If I say something, it would put a barrier between us, and I don't want that. I feel so guilty for not being more successful in having my children and grandchildren remain faithful to the church. Other than prayer, do you recommend something I could do, Claire? Well, Claire, you're the best judge of what you can say and not say. To The, the last thing you want to do is, uh, you know, alienate your children from yourself or from their religion uh, any further. Uh, if they're in the midst of this thing, um, wow, I, you know, I'm not sure what advice to give you other than, um, you know, use your best judgment in this case about what to say and, and how to say it. Um, a prayer, of course, is important, but if they're in the middle of the procedure, the odds of you being able to turn it around are about zero. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, as they say, don't waste capital uh, on uh, 
you know, trying to change them midstream. Mm -hmm. uh, I think your best bet would be to say, um, you know, after the whole thing is over, is to say, you know, you might want to be aware mm -hmm. of why the church teaches IVF um, as uh, morally problematic, mm -hmm. and then maybe uh, introduce them to things that they really did not hear uh, prior to engaging in it. I mean, our kids are just not catechized. Mm -hmm. um, right. They don't know. And so they go do this. They think this is just a perfectly innocent procedure. And again, what's the church doing teaching, you know, that uh, this is not a, a, an innocent procedure? So, um, right. you know, aren't I you think, in favor um, of, uh, of children and new life? Why are you putting yeah, a barrier to that? Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so um, uh, I would say maybe save your ammo um, for a little later after the whole thing has died uh, down, you know, and, and just say, hey, you know, just be, if you're thinking of conceiving, you know, um, an, another child, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, maybe a few months down the pike, just consider what's going on here with this IVF and just maybe give them an article. There are many good ones uh, that are out there that explain it. Uh, as I said in my new book, I, I have a, you know, a, Mm -hmm. a, a section of a chapter devoted to this uh, and, and some of the good articles that are there are cited to, to give you a sense of what's really happening but I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I would try to turn them around at this point um, because the, you know your chances are zero um, um, and your chances of course of alienating um, them from the church and from you are right. probably fairly high um, and so um, uh, try to prevent it from happening uh, Again, down the road, right? right exactly. And um, right. and just say, you know, if if you had been informed of this, you know, would you regret what happened to those other um, uh, embryos? Mm -hmm. And if so, maybe confession is the the way to go. And uh, of course, again, the whole thing of can you commit a mortal sin if you don't even know that you know IVF is wrong and why mm -hmm. it's wrong. Uh, probably not, because that's you, you don't meet the second criterion of sufficient knowledge, and that is a huge problem with IVF. There's just a, the majority of Catholics just don't even know right. uh, that it's wrong or why it's wrong, and so um, uh, we do have to get a little bit more. Um, well, let me uh, ask you catechesis uh, and education right. out there. Yeah, let me ask you a question about that, and maybe it, this is just you know observation mm -hmm. without any data to back it up. It seems like there's more people doing this. Now, is it just because the technology's gotten so good? Is it that people are waiting longer to have children, so they're finding out that it's harder to do, or something else that happens in the world and the ways people live their lives early on has had some negative impacts on some of these things, whether it could be STDs or other things that uh, might have occurred? I mean, I have no idea. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I think it's a combination of many of those factors mm -hmm. um, because I, I do know that um, people do wait uh, a fairly long time to have children. Uh, then when they uh, tr try and reverse themselves off of uh, birth control pill protocols that they've, they've been doing, they find it extremely hard to conceive. And so um, that's uh, one of the big problems. Um, and you're going to just see more and more cases of that as people are contracepti uh, artificially contracepting, um, you know, more and more. So that's that's going to be a, a problem. Uh, you're also going to see too that because the adoption lists are, you know, literally through the roof. You know, I mean, there's just mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just very long uh, to get a, a you know a baby in this country uh, going internationally. Uh, th there are periods where it's more um, easily done and periods where it's not more easily done. But, um, you know, so again, you know, adoption, uh, I recommend it heartily. I think it is exceedingly good mm -hmm. uh, to do. And, and I just I have a very good friend who's just adopted a, a, a little boy, um, uh, you know, came from, you know, uh, parents who were, uh, you know, had a drug addiction, but mm -hmm. this boy has just calm down. In fact, I was at dinner with them uh, last mm. night and, and they were just, uh, this little baby is just as p peaceful and calm mm. and, and loved as you could possibly be. Uh, so that is uh, right. a wonderful option, but at the same time, um, it's 
it's a little more difficult uh, these days because there, um, there are not as many babies uh, available for adoption Damn. because of the abortion. Right. Um, well, here uh, we are creating uh, this problem through having abortion and getting rid of the children who people are desperately wanting to adopt. And then because yeah, they can't exactly. adopt, then they're going through in virtual for IVF yeah, yeah. because they were contracepting yeah. to prevent because they were led the lie that they were in control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's wrong with this picture? Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's pretty bleak uh, sort of turn of events. We're, uh, you know, we're trying to... Uh, uh, control, you know, the increasing rate of depression in this country by simply giving more and more, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. to people, which actually uh, have a, you know, a, what we call diminishing uh, marginal utility. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of encouraging them to be religious, and I, I would just, uh, you know, encourage anybody who wants to read about this, uh, Dr. Harold Koenig, um, K-O-N-I-G, uh, if you uh, take a look at uh, K-O-E-N-I-G, if you don't use the umlaut, um, <laughs> uh, he's uh, a wonderful uh, person he's at Duke University. He's put together these studies that really do show that when you combine Christian uh, belief with uh, psych uh, psychological psychiatric therapy, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the odds of having that therapy work are skyrocketingly um, higher mm -hmm. uh, than if you just do psychotherapy by itself without any religious content. Uh, just take a look at those studies. They're really quite remarkable. And, and, and of course, we know that people who already are religiously affiliated have much lower rates of, of suicide, um, antisocial right. aggressivity, depression, anxiety, um, et cetera. So all these things, uh, you put it, you know, two and two together, and what are we doing? You know, we're just, uh, uh, you know, we're busy stoking the fires of anti-religiosity, um, you know, and we're basically stoking the fires of uh, against uh, Christ's moral teaching, uh, which have been uh, easily correlated with sound emotional health. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, just increase the number of pharmaceuticals of people who are now, um, you know, going into depressions. I mean, major psychiatric disorders among young people mm -hmm. are up, you know, it's almost to the point 30% will have a major, major psychiatric uh, uh, disorder before they're 24. You know, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, you know, and just give more more pills out, and of course, the diminishing marginal utility of the of, of the pharmaceuticals actually, uh, you know, makes the depression worse at the end of the day if a major psychiatric disorder occurs. It's mm -hmm. insane. It's the whole thing's insane. So, um, you know, I, I just look at it and just, uh, you know, I, I just have to say, okay, we just have to take the culture where it is. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to pray our way out of it, but we also have to be good evangelists mm. and start reading some stuff, you know, the, the whole Majas Institute, everything we do is we're trying to put out reasons for, mm. um, you know, uh, you know, not just, you know, God and, and the soul and Jesus and the church, but also mm. for the moral teaching of Christ and, and uh, you know, just for good marriage and, and for, for, you know, uh, children and just uh, an apologetic for our, you know, what Christ has been teaching, it's, it's the sanest mm. thing. It's not just going to lead to salvation. It's going to lead to sanity. It's going to lead to emotional health. It's going to lead to sound and good marriages with good marital satisfaction. And it's ultimately going to lead to a more peaceful culture. So I think we got to get out there and evangelize the world before, you know, our culture just takes a track of implosion from which it cannot return. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a, uh, a real concern. But I mean, uh, again, um, that's above my pay grade. That's mm. God's pay grade, uh, and He raises up saints. You know, I, I don't ever get negative. I don't ever lose hope. I do read the paper and I look at it and go, "Now what?" You know, I mean, I, I mean, there are days when you just want to lose heart, but I don't, because I've just seen it in mm. history, time after time after time, where you know it looks like you know the the church and Christ are out for the count, and then mm. all of a sudden. Boom! The turnaround happens. Wow. All these saints are coming out of nowhere. They're saying and doing exactly the right things. People are, are following them. And you look at that and you go, yeah. And to, besides all that, the church mm. is built on the blood of the martyrs. Figure that out. Mm. I mean, God's in charge. And thank God I'm not. And so uh, um, I, I follow him. I, I hope in him. And I just say, well, let's do as much as we can. And then, you know, let God, you know, who is the God of history, take control of all these circumstances 
Don't get right. despairing. Just keep your hope level up, the right. crossing the threshold of hope as our good Pope John Paul II, uh, always Saint uh, John Paul II now, uh, used to say. And of course, we, uh, we right. know that uh, God uh, is going to help us and work through our efforts uh, to bring some right. sanity, some love, some goodness into the world through us. Right. Reminds me of the musical Joseph and His Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat where the narrator mm -hmm. says, we've read the book, we know you come out on top. So it's kind of like uh, yeah. the same idea here. We know how it's going to end. Uh, yeah, exactly. Though it may not be the easiest way to get there, but we know at least yeah. the, at the end that there's a victory. Uh, Dear yeah. Father Spitzer, my grandson is training, training to be a shaman. Okay, I'm Catholic, but he wow. has not been brought up in the faith nor baptized. How do I explain the dangers of what he's doing, Diane? I wonder what kind of shaman he's planning on being. Well, Diane, um, uh, um, you know, how to, uh, to deal with this. I, I don't know your son, uh, so it's difficult to know what to do. But, um, you know, shamanism and some of the spiritual uh, dimensions of it can go very much awry and shamanism can be very dark indeed probably you're um, you know I don't think you're you may not be able to make much of a dent in in him and in his trajectory if he already is on it and has you know already been you know you know throwing himself into the effort uh, but sometimes by looking at some of the research that you can get much of it right off of the internet and take a look at some of the destructive forms mm -hmm. of shamanism that are out there and just um, I, I don't know how to do this diplomatically but just maybe send a few links mm -hmm. uh, to him and just say are you aware of some of these things I love you very much I'm just worried about you uh, just wanted you to see that maybe in the future if some of this kind of dark activity begins to happen mm -hmm. uh, with your own practice of shamanism, you know, if, if that's happening, mm -hmm. uh, well, please turn to me. I'd, I'd like to reintroduce you to Jesus Christ uh, who can um, uh, actually overcome, uh, you know, some of the dark side, the spiritual dark side right. uh, of what uh, shamanism uh, can do. So um, that's probably what I would do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think just saying, don't do it, it won't work. I, I can tell you if he's already on the trajectory, um, that's, that's probably not going to be your best bet. Uh, do your research. Look for, you know, the, the, you know you'll, you'll see all of the, the signs that they talk about when you start moving, you know, and, and you, know, you start doing some, uh, you know, of the, the, the shaman spiritual things. Uh, you can see certain forms of darkness that are beginning to happen, spiritual darkness is coming under the influence of the spirit through which you are uh, maybe, you know, uh, 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 casting your influence. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see what's happening and you can read about that and then, you know, maybe just include a few links uh, to those articles um, to uh, him and just uh, say, well, um, you know, if anything like this starts happening to you, you know, I, I'd like to reintroduce you to uh, Jesus, or in his case, I guess he was never introduced to Jesus. Right. I'd like to introduce you to Jesus right. because don't stay in the darkness too long because if you let it grip you, then terribly malevolent things right. can happen. Well, it's interesting. These things kind of the, with the paraphrase of the old Chesterton line when people stop believing in God, they don't, you know, stop believing in him. They, they start believing, they'll believe in anything, basically. And it, it's, yeah. it, and it's interesting, and that's, you know, and I kind of jumbled that up a little bit, but the point being is that, you know, it's interesting that so many people have turned away from quote-unquote traditional religion, but it's not that they're not worshiping mm -hmm. something, it might be the culture, but all, also these kind of alternate spiritualities which shows there's there's a yearning, there's a need that's not being satisfied, right? That's right. And of course, uh, uh, you start looking and you think, oh, the spirit world is the same as God, or the spirit world is just the spirit world. I mean, uh, one's the Jesus spirit world and one's a non-Jesus spirit world. Mm -hmm. 
But the non-Jesus spirit world, you, you know, you, it has a dark side. And, and that dark side, you don't want to play with it. You don't want to consort with it in any way, shape, or form. Even if it looks like, you know, it's a kind of an innocent practice of shamanism, know the dark side of the spiritual world that you are consorting with when you become, when you're entering into the life of a shaman. And, and, and of course, if, if you just take a look at that, look at maybe kind of the symptoms that begin to manifest themselves. And if you start seeing things that are worrisome, right. things that are malevolent, things that are really, you know, obviously putting you under a, a kind of a malevolent sort of spell, if you begin mm. to see these sorts of things, turn around and get out of it and throw your, use the name of Jesus to get out of it. And, and that's the main mm. thing to, right. to, to do. I mean, for, for my part, though, uh, I would probably say that's as much as you right. can do. Send him the links, send him right. the dangers, warn him that you know the spiritual world is not neutral. I mean, there's a good side of that spiritual world, uh, which of course Jesus is the, the head of, and there's a dark side of that spiritual world, and the evil spirit can uh, literally cloak himself right. in things that look innocent, things that make him look like an angel of light, right. but in point of fact are pulling you into the darkness but you'll feel it. You'll know from the emotional and the spiritual detachment that begins to happen, the, the sense of malevolence uh, that, that you begin to feel. You'll know mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you're on a, a dark track and get out of it. Use the name of Jesus. Know Jesus right. Christ and follow him. Well, it's interesting because in thinking of what you're saying, I'm thinking about what we're going through with the temptation in the desert and about power. Yeah and about the offering yeah. of power. And I'm thinking with some of these things, uh, there may be some undercurrent of shaman giving me some sort of powers or some other oh, thing like that. Oh, without a know, doubt. So that there's kind of that yes, temptation. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. There's no question. Right. And let's face it, you know, dark spiritual power uh, powers, what do they do? They share a little bit of that spiritual power, a little bit of that foreknowledge, mm -hmm. a little bit of that, you know, um, Transphysical stuff where you can just interpose your voice over a telephone line. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that power where you can levitate, or a little bit of that power uh, where you have, uh, you know, capable of, you know, doing paranormal things, et cetera, et cetera. All of that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, for all intents and purposes, those little promises of power, they're attractive at first, they seem to be neutral and innocent. But there's always a price to pay, always a price to pay. I mean, darkness starts, you say, oh, I'm just going to be a fortune teller. I'm just going to be a palm reader. I'm just going to do this. It's not going to, you know, tarot cards, it's not going to affect me. Of course it's going to affect you. If you're using things where you're trying to get a kind of knowledge or a kind of power or a kind of an influence over people that is not physical, normal, emotional, uh, spirit, regularly spiritual things, but you're looking mm -hmm. for something extraordinary and paranormal so you can have power over people or knowledge uh, to lord it over people etc you want that stuff you are going to pay for that stuff you contract with the spiritual force that you are using in order to get that power right now let's get uh, one more question in uh, as we hit the break dear father spitzer did jesus give judas holy communion at the last Supper. That's a question. If so, why would the Catholic Church not give Holy Communion to those who support abortion and other grave sinners? Beverly. Well, Beverly, uh, no, Jesus did not give uh, Holy Communion to um, uh, to uh, Judas at the Last Supper, um, uh, as far you know, at least uh, d deliberately. If he did, uh, then perhaps uh, uh, before Judas's. Uh, a crime was complete. Maybe uh, there was some attempt to uh, to do it, but as far as I know, uh, there was no deliberate attempt to give Judas uh, holy communion at the Last Supper. Um, and as far as I also know, and again, you know, this is uh, ambiguous indeed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, the whole idea, you know, that that uh, um, you can give holy communion to somebody who. Uh, is committing a sacrilege or something of that nature, 
has, you know, it's pretty much prohibited by St. Paul and, uh, in the New Testament. And so uh, uh, an interesting um, thought. But no, I don't mm -hmm. think Jesus is out there trying to promote mm -hmm. uh, giving uh, Holy Communion uh, to people who are busy promoting mass murder. Right. I, I just don't think there's any intention of that. I think the church has read it correctly. And by the way, as I said uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, if you're following the church, you're doing real well. You know, I mean, uh, you know, right. basically we do, we do not have control, uh, you know, over what, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how we can interpret the scriptures in the New Testament. At some point, you're going to have to follow the church. And right now, what the church teaches very clearly is, yeah, uh, I mean, if you're out there promoting mass murder of innocent human beings, right. um, you shouldn't be receiving communion. And, and I would have to say, you know, there is a promotion of the mass murder of, of innocent human beings. Right, it's, absolutely. You know, and and that's the, I think yeah. that's the key phrase that we want to keep in mind for people, too. It's the promotion of it, not only somebody who might go along with it, as bad as that might be. We're talking yeah. about people promoting it and, and leading people astray. With that being the case, we've got to take a break. Much more ahead with okay. Father Spitzer as we continue with your questions. Stay with us. And we do appreciate you staying with us as we continue with Father Spitzer's universe answering your questions. And also I wanted to mention we've got uh, a wonderful radio program featuring the EWTN open lineup, lineup of heavy hitters, which people can check out as well on our radio feed. There it is up there with uh, Virgilio, Wade, Pacwa, Milady, and Donovan. Now that's a lineup. Check out that power hitting lineup and we move to our own slugger here, uh, who's knocking him out of the park here, <laughs> even if he was a Dodger fan all those years ago from Hawaii. <laughs> I was. Listen, we listening on his crystal set. Uh, so. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to. Uh, yeah. My <laughs> transistor radio. There you go, right. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, is it possible to exorcise an entire country? Venezuela was once very Catholic, but has been plunged for more than two decades into institutionalized Satanism. This is their perspective. Witchcraft seems to be a state cult. The Venezuelan people need a lot of prayer to win a spiritual war. They seem to be losing. Uh, Karina, and obviously, if it's not Satanism, it's certainly uh, some bizarre version of socialism. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Narina, you can't exercise a whole country. Exorcism is a right that's meant to be done on particular people, perhaps a group of people um, that's in a specific locale. Um, but you can pray for Venezuela, and you can um, uh, pray that uh, whatever kind of uh, evil influence that might be there uh, in Venezuela, that it's uh, going to turn around, and you can get a whole group of people to pray. Uh, but exorcism really is a rite that's meant to be performed in the presence of somebody or a group of people, and pretty hard to do that for mm -hmm. a whole country. Okay, very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, did Satan recognize Jesus as the Son of God when he was testing Christ during his temptation in the desert? I think we talked a little bit about that. One of my Bible teachers says, says that Satan's eyes were veiled by God so that he didn't recognize Jesus as the Son of God. I'm finding this hard to believe. Esther. Esther, I'm finding it super hard to believe. Okay. I don't believe that for one single second. I think Satan knew exactly who he was dealing with, which is why he begins those temptations. If you're really the Son of God, why, you should do this. The reason he's saying, if you're really the Son of God, is not because he doesn't believe it, but he's trying to, of course, lever that to get Jesus to think that, you know, uh, hey, you know, I'm just as much of a big shot as my father. I, I don't have to obey him, you know, as my niece used to, used to say to me, you know, hey, you know, uh, you're not my 
Father, you know, uh, you can't <laughs> tell me to get off the fence in the zoo. And I, I'd always say, oh, yes, I can. <laughs> Otherwise, no zoo. <laughs> But anyway, uh, right. the point, and, of course, and is... And that leverage, uh, as you indicated, too, the idea of, in a sense, saying, prove it. Yeah, right? yeah, so exactly. So why don't you... Uh, prove it. You know, mm -hmm. if you are, uh, then prove it to me that you are. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. right. But, oh, no, he knows exactly who he's dealing with. So, Esther, follow your instincts. You are absolutely okay. correct. Uh, the whole idea that Satan doesn't know is, uh, um, uh, as they say, really far-fetched. Okay. Uh, the old uh, divine veiling. Good. Dear Father Spitzer, on a recent show, uh-oh, a question was asked about how people should dress when they go to Sunday Mass. Father Spitzer said he would not turn an improperly dressed person away. I disagree with mm -hmm. his answer. When we go to the house of God, the king of the universe, we need to always dress in our Sunday best. Where I come from, the Philippines, men go to church in their suit coat and tie, and women are decently well-dressed. A church I attend in Hawaii posted a dress code by all doors and everyone complies. Shouldn't all churches do this? Mary. Well, Mary, I do think that uh, having a dress code is, is not a bad thing, uh, but I still stick by what I said. If mm. somebody came and they were just not uh, um, uh, dressed, uh, well, I mean, if they were dressed in some indecent way, you could certainly turn them uh, away, but if they were just uh, uh, dressed in... Uh, let's just say, uh, casual clothes or something of that nature, um, and maybe with tennis shoes or something of that nature, you might just say, um, you know, gee whiz, you know, maybe uh, uh, next time you, you could, uh, you could uh, dress up a little bit. But mm -hmm. no, I wouldn't turn them away. I, I, I don't think that Jesus would have turned them away either, to be right. honest. And um, so I'm going to just uh, uh, say we must right. uh, just agree to disagree there. Right. Um, and um, and uh, that's it. But sure, of course, if somebody is indecent, you could right. you could uh, say, hey, this isn't the place for that. Or, uh, you know, if you want to post some kind of a dress standard. Right, exactly. And in Hawaii, sometimes that's needed. Right. Uh, people can come in in the swim trunks and some really, uh, shall we say, um, uh, revealing sorts of outfits. Uh, in that case, you should mm -hmm. really post a dress code if that's a problem uh, in your church. It certainly hasn't been a problem. Uh, in the places where I have been ministering. Right, okay. Very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, it seems to me that the bishops have the discretion to make their own rules. I see conflict ranging from procedures to doctrine. I thought Jesus said, go to all nations and teach what I've taught you. Why are they arguing about things that were settled 2,000 years ago? All the discussions, voting and confusion make the Church of Peter be a democracy instead of the one that was instituted by our Lord. This is Elna. Well, Elna, I, I would just say um, there is a difference between doctrine and discipline. And, um, you know, a doctrine would be like the Trinity, or it would be like uh, the incarnation of Jesus, or something of that nature, where it is a matter of faith, and it has been declared de fide definitum. But then there are also um, areas where we're talking about how to practice the faith, um, there are very uh, various disciplines, and how to um, how to apply a, par a, <clears throat> a particular standard uh, in a particular social or cultural context, and there is room for disagreement and debate uh, in those areas. And the bishops are merely doing uh, what they they should be doing, namely trying to get at the truth, the best way of handling this. Uh, of course, you, you, I, I know you and maybe I see things in a little bit more black and white fashion mm -hmm. um, uh, than some of the bishops do. Uh, but um, those things that they're debating, they're not de fite definitum. De, uh, definitum. So they're, they're not uh, already declared, um, you know, um, uh, doctrines mm -hmm. uh, of the faith uh, by the church. So uh, these are things that where the church is really applying mm -hmm. some kind of a standard to a particular situation, and they're trying to find uh, uh, the, the right way to do that. And so um, uh, a debate is actually uh, uh, appropriate. Now, I have my views mm -hmm. on the, how the outcome of that debate should be, but um, I cannot say that there, there should not be a debate uh, going on about it, nor... Uh, do I want to say that? I think uh, the best way sometimes of 
coming up with um, uh, the proper mode of conduct is to debate it. Mm -hmm. For years, we have let various kinds of politicians uh, get away with, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, promoting uh, abortion on a massive scale. Um, and um, yeah. now I think we're kind of trying to backtrack on that. And, and I think if the debate can bring that about so that we can finally get a sense of, gee, what's appropriate mm -hmm. uh, as a Catholic? Uh, is it sinful to promote mass murder? Well, I, I, I think, you know, if you say that it is, then, uh, then we should follow, you know, our Eucharistic doctrine. I mean, was it a sin for somebody to promote uh, the killing of people in, in, in you know, um, prisoner of war camps, innocent children? Uh, you know, uh, but they, they didn't do it. They didn't pull the, the, the tab on the, on the little gas pellets that mm -hmm. went into the, into the baths right. uh, to kill the people. They, didn't, they weren't there at the crematoria that uh, were, were burning the bodies, but they were definitely promoting it. Um, should we have just said, ah, no problem, right. uh, you're just a promoter, uh, you know, go ahead right. and, um, you know, do it. Of course you, you, you're not going to say that. I mean, and so we're trying to get to that point, but actually the debate is actually getting us to the point where we can make a declaration mm -hmm. that we haven't been uh, making in the public arena for a long, long time. So right. I think uh, here you want to appreciate the debate rather than disdain it, it may get us to some moral progress and even to some moral uh, a progress and moral application within the public arena. Very good. Let's, uh, let's turn to Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. uh, page 97, you talk about the idea that when Satan proceeds to the third temptation, he no longer attempts to cloak his deception. Rather, it's all about pure power. Then you go on to talk about the fact that some scholars have contended that the Father allowed Satan to have such power after the fall of Adam. It is highly unlikely that God would have given up his sovereignty to Satan because of human sinfulness. So discuss that point. What, what, was, the, what yeah. was the point? Yeah, of course God is not going to give any of his sovereignty to Satan. Uh, you know, the only reason that Satan is able to work is, yes, God's permissive will allows him to work uh, in, in the world. Um, and of course, uh, that's because he, he's free and we're free, and God's not going to take uh, freedom away from us or from him before the end time. At the end time, of course, there's going to be the separation of the two domains. And um, uh, uh, so uh, in the meantime, we're stuck. Uh, but do we have the name of Jesus to protect us? Of course we do. Uh, do we have our faith in the sacraments, and especially the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of reconciliation to protect us and shield us? Of course we do. But we also have the freedom to not go to church, to not go to confession, mm -hmm. to not receive the Holy Eucharist, to not uh, use the name of Jesus, to not take seriously his moral teaching. Mm -hmm. We have all of these things as our defense, uh, and, and of course, they really do work. I can attest uh, that they really do work. But uh, the point is, is we don't have to use them. Uh, we're free not to use them. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, uh, I guess my, my point is that we should try to evangelize the world as much as we can so that people, more and more people, will use these great gifts that Jesus has given us, his great name that he has given us, these great sacraments that he has given us, his great word and his teaching through the church that he's given us. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, um, God's not going to take our freedom away from us, nor the freedom away from uh, the evil spirit. But oh yes, does the devil want power? It's all about power. Uh, of, of course it's all about power. He, he doesn't want to serve God. He, he, he basically wants to be autonomous. He wants to be the source of his own power. And, you know, Milton's great speech of Lucifer down in hell, you know, he's trying to buck up his fellow devils there. And he says, you know, hey, you guys, um, th don't get so worried about being miserable down here. Hey, an eternity of misery is worth it not to have to bend or genuflect a single second up in heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, none of us believes that, but could the evil spirit? Precisely. That's the whole point. 
I'm never going to bend the knee to you at all. I'd rather be miserable for an eternity. And some people, not just the evil spirit, can make that choice. And that's why I always say freedom is an awesome power that God has given us. We can choose our way right into hell. We can choose our way right into darkness. And so that's why Jesus so fervently warns right. against things. He, he's, he's constantly pushing up, uh, you know, against uh, the, uh, the Pharisees. He's warning them for their own sake. Mm -hmm. Your self-righteousness is going to kill you. you. You don't think you have to be compassionate to anybody. You think you can just build up these huge burdens and lay them on men's shoulders without lifting a finger to budge them. You think you can exclude all these sinners from the kingdom of heaven when you yourselves are so self-righteous, you're probably not going to get in. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, he, the point that you know, he's trying to say is, is uh, hey, you know, you're free. And that freedom requires responsibility. Otherwise, your freedom just as, as, as easily as it could allow you to choose all of the graces, the sacraments, the, the following of the teaching of Jesus right into the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. you could choose all of the darkness that, or you would follow uh, the way of perdition into hell. Right. So that's basically the whole point. Uh, you know, it's about power, it's about freedom, and of course, uh, pure autonomy is a power play. Mm -hmm. You know, when people say, you know, I'm free, I just want to be free, that means don't you exercise any control over me and don't you dare ask me to live up to some of your standards. Mm -hmm. I'm free to do whatever I want, but we're not free to do whatever we want. We should be respecting other people. Mm -hmm. We should be, uh, you know, looking to be good, decent, principled uh, uh, you know, um, right. uh, people with ideals that are really worthy uh, of, of the Christian writ and so forth. This is this is what we're, you know, we're supposed. We're not free to do right. anything. Well, we you can think you're free right. to do anything exactly. you want, right. but if you play to that, uh, you'll you'll play to darkness. You'll play to right. the evil spirit right. for sure. But the problem I mean, we have in today's society seems to be this idea that people want this perfect autonomy but no responsibility. So I can do whatever no I want, but there, no, but there should yeah. be no downside to my actions. And if there are, then that's somebody, right. it's somebody else's fault. Yeah, <laughs> well, right. that's right. right. But of course, you, if you say that, uh, you're naive because, of course, every time you have a freedom, there's two, two ways you can go. You can't have freedom without two paths. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the paths is going to be responsible, and the other path is going to be irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way it is. And if you say, well, I want to be free, and I'm going to take the irresponsible path, then don't be surprised if you wind up not only destroying the people around you, undermining the people around you, dissing the people around you, but destroying yourself and your prospects for salvation as well. Don't be surprised. I mean, that's the price of, of uh, you, you want to be free? You, you, you know, you say you, you don't want to take responsibility for anything or anyone, then you're going to take the path of irresponsibility and you will be a destructive force. And that destructive force will ultimately not only undermine the various people around you, but undermine the world. It's interesting, too, uh, on page 98, uh, about you talk about how Satan obeys Jesus and leaves him when he's commanded to leave him. That just shows yeah. the lack of power that the devil really has. Oh yeah, right. I mean at the end of the day, as I always say, the name of Jesus, if you really get start feeling yourself uh, in the presence of a malevolent spirit, you mm -hmm. just keep repeating, in the name of Jesus, my Lord and Savior, be gone, Satan. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, my Lord and Savior, be gone, Satan. You keep repeating that, that name of Jesus will just chase him off. He's powerless in front of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm telling you, this definitely works if you say it with faith. So the point that I'm, I'm uh, again making here is, is that, uh, uh, yeah, Satan is powerless before Jesus. He tries to play all these mm -hmm. cards. He tries to tempt. He tries to cajole. He tries to get Jesus's, you know, he's, his human nature has a base side to it. He's trying to get Jesus to use the base side of his 
human nature, the sensual side of its human nature. Just change these rocks into, sto into bread, these stones into bread. And you know, you, then you'll really be satisfied. Then he plays to his ego, you know. Hey, you don't have enough power. You know, here you are sitting around like a pauper in the desert. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? I got some stuff to show you. This, mm -hmm. this is really going to be good stuff. And of course, the, the, the evil spirit is trying to play to his, his ego. Mm -hmm. And then finally, of course, he's got to go with the spiritual pride, right? So, hey, you know, you can do anything you want. I mean, you're like 100% free. People everywhere just got to be free, uh, you know, as the old song goes. Yes. And so the, the idea is, yeah, just throw yourself down from this parapet. Don't worry. The angels are going to come and protect you. And, and of course, uh, right. Jesus says, uh, you know, you shall worship the Lord your God alone. Him alone right. shall you serve. Okay. Wouldn't you know that that so, would have been sung by a group called the Rascals? But, uh, the Young Rascals. You know. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Now you also make. I, I don't think they meant it in that way. But <laughs> no, that, no. But you know, but, uh, you could caricature it that <laughs> way. There you go. You also <laughs> mention here. You, you talk about the end of that, and you say the first part of Jesus's plan, the plan of the Father, is actualized. Okay, and then you also mm -hmm. go on to say. So what does that mean? And you also talk about absolutely no precedent precedent in all Jewish literature for what just happened. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know this. Uh, first of all, of course, a showdown between the Son of God who's incarnate within human nature mm -hmm. uh, versus Satan, uh, that's not going to happen mm -hmm. uh, anywhere in, in Jewish uh, literature. Wow. But at the same time, uh, what we see uh, about Satan, like for example in Job, he's kind of an advocate that's against human beings. So he's always trying to say, you know, Job's not as big a deal as you think. Uh, you know, that's his, his basic mm -hmm. line. You know, let me at him for a while, and I'll get him to turn. But you've been pampering that guy for way too long. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of uh, uh, his role in, in, in the Job uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at what's going on with Jesus, you know, the devil has free reign to try and turn Jesus. So there's a real similarity there. Mm -hmm. But, of course, Jesus defeats him right at the outset. So he just keeps every time... Uh, you know, a, a, a temptation is put forward and it always has, you know, multiple dimensions. If you're really the son of God, you can do this. Just go ahead and do it. You're free. Do it. You know, assert your uh, autonomy. Assert this over against obedience to your father. You're the son of God. If anyone doesn't have to obey, it ought to be you. You're the guy who doesn't need to obey. You're like the son of God. Go ahead. Why should you be subservient to him? The very thing that uh, uh, Lucifer, let, that Satan himself cannot stand is the subservience to God. He's never going to obey. He's never going to surrender to God. He's never going to be subservient to God. And he's certainly never going to self, uh, sacrifice himself for God. So, so the idea uh, here is, you know, you've got a showdown, um, you know, between the one who says, uh, I don't need to be perfectly autonomous in order to be the son of God. I need to be perfectly loving in order to be the son of God. And the perfect love of my heavenly father is to be obedient to him, not to assert my autonomy over against him. You got it all wrong. The autonomy is not the path uh, to, um, to salvation. Uh, love is the path to salvation. And the, you can suggest the autonomy principle all you want. I'm not buying it. The problem is in our culture, autonomy's gone crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, literally, I mean, you look at that, that whole thing of, of Lucifer, you know, to assert yourself over against God, you don't need to obey. But, you know, love doesn't mean being uh, s surrendering and obeying. Of course, love means surrendering and obeying some part of your ego for the sake of the other. And, and for the sake of goodness itself. Of course it means that. But the idea of the culture is no real power, real fulfillment, a real worthy, successful life means, as Frank Sinatra would have said, I did it my way. I just had a pure autonomy life. You know, this is, this is uh, you know, all that I can hope for. And so... Um, 
uh, th th this is uh, kind of the, the, the culture writ large, and um, not saying that Frank Sinatra meant it <laughs> formally that way in the song, but you can tell, right. you know, the remnants of what's going on in our culture is, I, I did it my right. way. I want it my way. I will have it my way, uh, you know, and to heck with love, to heck with surrendering to others, to heck with obeying authorities that are beyond me, even the authority of God himself. You know, that right. whole idea, um, you know, underneath the veil of, you know, I want it my way is to heck with everybody else. Absolutely. That's the opposite side of the of, of Very of much the of a, a 60s perspective that unfortunately we absolutely, seem to still be uh, dealing with, right? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. With that, we really true. need your blessing to get us out the door, Father. We're just Very out good. of time. Okay, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord who has given us this precious freedom but also the precious love and the precious revelation of himself. We, may he keep us on the path to salvation. May he keep us humble so that we always look to him and always seek to follow him in obedience and love so that we not only enter the kingdom of heaven, but lead others to do so as well. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next week. Be well. And of course, remember, all the Father Spitzer's books are available through the Edwin Religious Catalog, as are wonderful DVDs of several series he did over the years. Next up, we've got Jesus' Defeat of Satan in the Desert. We'll be moving on talking about exorcisms. That should be quite interesting. And the EWT Bookmark, A Definitive Guide for Solving Biblical Questions about Mary and Mary Among the Evangelists by William Albrecht and Dr. Christian Kopis. Uh, so look forward to that, an interesting book interview. And we've got a massive ordination installation from our Senior William Koenig as the 10th Bishop of Wilmington, Delaware, Thursday, July 15th, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on EWTN. And we shall see you again next time when we once again enter Father Spitzer's universe. See you then.